Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome. Let us summarize some of the points that were dealt with in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we dealt with some of the events in the history of immunology, which led to the discovery of antibodies and macrophages. And then we looked at the different kinds of the cells in the immune system and the concept that all these cells arose from a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Due to lack of time in the last lecture, we were not able to go into the experiment that was done to show the presence of this hematopoietic stem cell. Before showing the presence of the hematopoietic stem cell, as events took place, there were experiments that were done in order to find out if in fact the cells that arose and populated the humoral and the cellular immune system were actually derived from immigrating cells. In other words, once the thymus differentiated, the question was asked whether these cells actually arose from cells that were immigrating from elsewhere or is was it possible that all these cells that make up the T cells coming from the thymus or for that matter from the bursa, did they arise within the tissue itself or within the organ itself like thymus and the bursa. So, experiments were done to find out if the cells that were coming into the thymus were coming in from elsewhere. Now, at that point in history, several experiments were done using embryos of chicken and chicken eggs. So, if in embryology, there are several experiments that are done to look at how embryogenesis occurs, how the embryo develops and one of the favorite models is to look at the chicken egg. So, one takes a chicken egg and looks at it under the light and then cuts a small window, cuts a small window to find out excuse me, let me go on to the pen. So, if you had a chicken egg, one would look at it under the light and see which part of the egg has got the embryo and then cut a small window over there and then put a cow slip on top, so that you could observe how the embryo developed inside. Similar such experiments were done using two, two different chicken eggs, one of them being derived from the female and one of them being derived from the male or so to say that these embryos were male and female. The objective of trying to use the male and female was that a lot of experiments during those days were done using metaphase spreads and looking at the appearance of chromosomes. And if one looks at the female and the male set of chromosomes in chicken, you find that the female one has got a smaller one associated with the bigger chromosome and that is shown clearly over here and it is referred to as Z and W. In contrast, the male cells will have two chromosomes which are similar and they are called as Z and, and Z. And therefore, if you had cells that were derived from the female, one could distinguish it by doing a metaphase spread and searching for this smaller chromosome. So, if when you 
took these eggs and then cut open a small area or make a small window and then juxtapose these two eggs and then seal it with wax. The underlying membrane would fuse together and the blood vessels would fuse allowing the circulation to be mixed and then have a continuity between the two embryos. And with time there would be a joint circulation that is established between the two embryos and then once the, once the birds developed or chickens hatched you could look at took out the bursa or took out the thymus because earlier experiments had found that thymectomy as I told you in the last class that thymectomy and bursectomy led to a decrease in the number of small lymphocytes that are present by morphological uh, examination by staining these uh, blood preparations. So, they took this developed or ch hatched chicks and then looked at these organs the thymus and the bursa and then took out these cells and then did a, did a metaphase spread and found that actually there was a mixture of cells that means there was a cells that were derived from the other one would have the other chromosome that was there. And therefore, this told um, uh, experimentalists that in fact cells were actually immigrating from the other embryo into the one that was fused to it. So, once this immigration aspect of um, cells going into the thymus was, uh, was, was shown, then the question was how can it be shown that a single hematopoietic stem cell actually gives rise to all the rest of the cells, all the rest of the hematopoietic cells uh, in, the, in the mouse or for that matter for the immune system. Now, this was an experiment that is called as the spleen cell or spleen colony forming unit assay which was shown by Till and Mikhailov in 1961. Now, as I told you earlier that in order to find out the function of various organs, experiments aimed at removing that particular organ for example, thymectomy, bursectomy, hypophysectomy and so on and so forth and then see what would happen once that organ is removed, what sort of cells would be absent, what sort of hormones would be absent and uh, so on and so forth. In a similar experiment, Till and Mikhailov found that you could remove all the immune cells in the body of the mouse by doing or subjecting them to X irradiation at 950 rads. The dose of exposure is very important because this is the dose that would allow the mouse to live. As you all know, higher doses of X, uh, irradiation would actually kill the mouse or for that matter even human beings. And this exposure of uh, irradiation was done at 950 rad and this would affect all cells that would that have the capacity to divide or proliferate. Whereas, those cells that did not have the capacity to proliferate would be more resistant to this dose of ex, uh, this dose of radiation. So, what they did was to take two mice, one was called as the donor, the other was called as the recipient because it was receiving, receiving the cells from the donor. Now, this recipient was exposed to 950 rads and then after a certain amount of time, they were they received a normal bone marrow cells that were derived from the donor. So, in other words you could take the femur of this donor mouse and break it and, and inside the pulp if you remove the pulp you would have cells in it that would come out into a petri plate, take out those cells and adoptively transfer or inject it into this mouse that is the recipient. Now, after about 7 to 10 days one would remove the spleen which is located in this area. take out the spleen and then look for colonies that have that are there in the spleen. For example, over here which I have designated in this organ and there would be several other colonies that would form. So, all these would form from these cells that had the ability to immigrate 
into the spleen. And once these cells immigrated into the spleen, it would start to proliferate and therefore, the colonies. So, this was the assay that was done to show that when you took out bone marrow, these cells were derived from the bone marrow. And these bone marrow cells had the ability to repopulate a spleen, which is actually a secondary lymphoid organ. And given time, these cells would actually form different kinds of lymphocytes. But this, this, is an, this is an assay or a model that you must remember that exposure to irradiation would result in mutations and therefore, one could not have a viable model at the end of some, some time except to show in a short duration that these cells were actually forming colonies in the spleen and that they had the ability to show you certain characteristics that, that were evident for lymphocytes. So, this again is called as the spleen colony forming unit assay and it was discovered in 1961. Now, modern days you have as I told you in the last class, there is an antigen called, called as stem cell antigen 1. So, one could look at the presence of this antigen and there are methods to isolate these stem cells by using advanced machines. You could isolate these stem cells and then give it to various kinds of mice. For example, mice that are that are mutated called as skid mice, severe combined immunodeficient mice which do not have lymphocytes. And so, you could actually one could actually isolate human stem cells and put them into these skid mice and humanize that mouse in order to see how human lymphocytes behave in a essentially in a mouse bag. So, so much for a spleen cell colony forming unit assay. Now, as we go on, we find that this capacity to form lymphocytes from a hematopoietic stem cell or the generation of the hematopoietic stem cell as it was alluded to from the bone marrow in the previous slide. One sees that in, in different animals, it is not only the bone marrow, that, but different other organs also take part in hematopoiesis earlier on during gestation. For example, in, in the chicken, you find that in addition to the bone marrow, you had the yolk sac that participated in hematopoietic stem cell before hatching. After hatching of course, you had the bone marrow participating in providing those hematopoietic stem cell precursors. In the mouse, you find in addition to the yolk sac, you had the fetal, fetal liver as well as the fetal spleen playing uh, a, major, a, a role during an optimal role approximately during these times before birth as I have indicated to you in the colors. And finally, of course, the bone marrow takes over the function of hematopoietic stem cell uh, production in the adult stage. In the humans, you find that the fetal liver plays some, some role in addition to the yolk sac. Finally, the, the bone marrow takes over the, uh, the function of hematopoietic stel, stem cell uh, production after birth. So, these are of course, the approximate timetables that are involved in hematopoietic just to hematopoietic stem cell production. This, this slide just to uh, has been put in here just to tell you that in addition to the bone marrow, other organs do play a part in hematopoietic stem cell production earlier on during gestation. Now, to put all these things together, now that we know that there are different types of cells, lymphocytes. And how do these lymphocytes participate in the immunological reaction or the immune system? So, the immune system has been known to have two arms so to say and that is called as the innate immunity and the acquired immunity. The inna innate immunity is more non-specific in nature while the acquired immunity is more specific in its interactions. As, a, as I told you earlier, these two categories can be visualized as humoral as well as cellular. Now, what happens in innate immunity? What is innate immunity? Innate immunity is the immunity that you have got during birth or you have received as you were born. Now, these are as I told you earlier that these are mostly non-specific in nature. For example, it consists of anatomical barriers, for example, the skin and the mucous membrane. 
Now, the skin acts as a barrier for a variety of infections because of its nature and also perhaps because of the pH that is there in the skin. Certain, certain viruses and bacteria do not tolerate the pH that is present in the skin in certain areas of the skin and therefore, they will not be able to uh, infect. And the mucus that is, uh, that is present in that is present in uh, many of the uh, many of these cavities. This is also associated with what is called as MALT or mucosal associated immune system, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, okay, MALT that you will see in many of the textbooks. So, you, you will see that this mucus has got uh, several immunological molecules like for example, IgA secretions. Now, IgA secretions are a barrier to infections because of their very nature. They have a lot of polysaccharide and they, they agglutinate various kinds of organisms and do not allow them to infect. And therefore, you have in your nose mucosal secretions which act as a barrier. Then you have of course, the physiological barrier for example, temperature. Many of the viruses and bacteria cannot divide or cannot metabolically function in the, the temperature of the 37 degrees. And therefore, you have for example, whenever you get an infection, you have fever and this is essentially to block certain infections. And of course, you have the low pH as I alluded to uh, earlier on that might be present in certain areas of the skin. And then you have a variety of chemical mediators. Now, what are these chemical mediators? These chemical mediators are for example, certain of these proteins like interferons and uh, uh, so on and so forth, which actually like example lysozyme. Lysozyme actually cleaves the cell wall of bacteria and causes inhibition of bacteria, bacterial infections because they lead to bacterial lysis. And therefore, you see these are all non-specific in nature. So, when you look at all these, all these in total, you find that they have a kind of a barrier towards infection. In addition to that, you have what is called as a phagocytic barrier, which all of you know like neutrophils and macrophages, which we saw in the last class that they had the ability to phagocytose bacteria. They were chemotactic in nature and this chemotactic is part of this in innate immunity. In addition to that, you had inflammatory barriers like for example, what you call as an acute phase uh, reaction or ac acute phase proteins that are synthesized in response to infections in mammals. These contain several serum proteins, which in addition also has certain, certain proteins like complement, which I told you in the last class and we will go into that a little bit in this class also and also a protein called as the C reactive protein. So, all these help in blocking infections because complement leads to bacterial lysis or inactivation of, of viruses that, that have the ability to infect. In addition to that, I have already told you about chemotaxis in the previous uh, lecture about how the cell walls have the ability or have chemicals that, that, that can cause chemotaxis of macrophages from inside, they can cross from inside the capillaries and come out into the area of infection. As opposed to adaptive immunity, which is more specific in nature, which we spoke about in the last, last class that they produced antibodies and these antibodies were specific to the antigens that they would react to. And therefore, this uh, toxin neutralization that we referred to in the last class are all part of acquired immunity. Now, this acquired immunity actually involves not only antibody production by B cells, it also involves interaction between T cells and B cells because T cells also have the ability to recognize antigen and the T cells would cooperate with the B cells, help them to proliferate and help them to make these antibodies. All these interactions are specific in nature and in addition to that you have, you have the phenomena called as antigen presentation, which we will be going into in, in, a, in a small way in the, in the coming few slides.
So, you had antigen, you have antigen specificity in adaptive immunity and of course, the diversity of these specificities are involved in, uh, in the antibody generation which you will come to uh, learn in the classes on antibodies as well as an aspect of immunological memory which I will tell you in the next line and of course, self and non-self discrimination. So, what is immunological memory? Immunological memory pertains to the fact that if one gets over or overcomes a particular disease for example, during those days uh, smallpox the individual would never again come down with smallpox. So, what is this? this? This said was because of immunological memory. So, if you were to look at as, as were confirmed uh, during those days by injecting various kinds of antigens like sheep red blood cells or KLH or ovalbumin, they would find that if you were to look at the antibody responses to uh, let us say for example, uh, ovalbumin and you were, you were to look at antibodies to ovalbumin over a period of days in you know, let us say in any of the higher animals for example, chicken or for that matter rabbits. And so, you had days after in injection or immunization. So, days after immunization and it would go roughly like that. And then you looked at the ability to form antibodies, antibody generation let me put it as. Of course, this antibody generation could be measured by the antigen antibody complex that you learned how uh, could be precipitated in the previous class. And that was in fact, some of the uh, first few experiments that were done, but if uh, nowadays one can follow these antibody titers by looking at ELISA's by taking the blood or bleeding these animals and then looking at uh, the ELISA titers of the antibody against the uh, particular antigen that you had used to immunize. So, if you were to immunize and take out this blood at various times, bleed these animals and look at the antibodies in the blood, you found that if you had the anti look at antibody titers, you would find that there would be an increase in the beginning and then there would be a drop. And then if you admin administer antigen again at this point, you would find that these antibodies had a property of showing a higher response. So, this was this was after the immunization second time with the same antigen for example, if you were using ovalbumin. So, you would find that the antibodies would pick up uh, rapidly. So, if these were let us say if you were to have 7 days over here. So, in the same approximately same around uh, 15 to 16 days you would find that the titer of the anti ovalbumin antibody rose much higher than this uh, than this first uh, first phase on the other hand if one immunized at this point if you immunize with another antigen such as uh, let us say klh you would find that the same small peak would come and after 7 days at the end of at the end of uh, uh, 7 days after this initial injection with KLH, if one was, was to in, in inject it a second time with KLH, then you would have the same secondary response coming up. So, this is called as memory because these cells retain the memory that they had seen the antigen earlier and they were able to kick in a response much rapid and a much higher response to the same antigen. So, this is a phenomenon of immunological memory which is characteristic of acquired immunity. So, going on further to look at other aspects of the immune system, we need to know how can it be shown that T cells are in fact important and how can it be shown that T cells are in fact important. And more importantly, we alluded to the discovery by Eli Mechnikov 
and how important these macrophages were that he found in the starfish larva and in higher animals these, these, these are now come to known as antigen presenting cells. Now, what is what are the experimental proofs to show that these three major players are very important for an immune response. So, just to summarize in this slide, we have the bone marrow giving rise to hematopoietic stem cells and these stem cells if they migrated to the bursa or in, in higher mammals if it was the bone marrow itself it would give rise in that differentiating environment in that milieu of the availability of different kinds of growth factors or cytokines they would give rise to a B lymphocyte which would go on to produce antibodies upon stimulation with an antigen that you will come to learn later on. On the other hand if these stem cells were to migrate into the thymus which is a primary lymphoid organ the thymus and the bursa are primary lymphoid organs whereas, the spleen and other lymph nodes are called as secondary lymphoid organs. So, migration into the thymus resulted in the differentiation of these precursors or uh, stem cells into T lymphocytes which had the property of differentiating into other kinds of T subsets which would in turn help B cells or B lymphocytes to make more of antibodies by virtue of the type of cytokines that they secreted in response to antigen mediated activation of T lymphocytes. What this antigen mediated T lymphocyte activation means we will see in the next few slides. So, therefore, in order to see that the B cells, T cells and antigen presenting cells are important for the immune system let us see what are the experiments that were done to show their importance. As I told you earlier all these experiments developed in the earlier stages by looking at the antibody titers. So, as the history of immunology developed as I told you in the last class all these developed in the initial stages by the ability of the antigen and antibody to form a clouding, clouding or, or a precipitate. And these would of course, as I told you precipitate uh, at a certain concentration and this was evident even in Octoloni uh, double diffusion test which I showed you in the last class. Now, of course, all these assays later on developed into much more uh, really accurate assays called as radioactive uh, radio immuno assays excuse me. So, if one follows all these different uh, uh, ways of measuring antibody titers one could follow what are the different uh, what are the uh, ways by which an animal responds to different kinds of antigens and therefore, of course, one could know whether it was a primary response or whether it was a secondary response. Now, in order to uh, know whether actually cells would secrete antibodies there were other assays that were done in order to find out whether there were more cells or more B cells that would secrete antibodies. And this one such assay is called as the hematopoietic plaque forming cell assay. So, or a PFC assay. Now, what this shows you is that the cells that are actually producing these antibodies. And in order to understand this assay, let us go into what type of antigens that were used during those days as is immunogen. I alluded to you earlier that the sheep red blood cell was easily available and therefore, was used as a powerful immunogen because it is quite good in activating various kinds of lymphoid cells. So, if you look at the response to sheep red blood cell one would can make sheep uh, antibodies to sheep red blood cell in a different animal like the rabbit. And so, when you made antibodies and I also alluded to you in the earlier classes that uh, the serum factor additional serum factor called as alexin or now named as complement was also responsible in inactivating bacteria. So, how do these antibodies antigen and complement function in order to make this assay a viable one. So, 
what one does is to take the sheep red blood cell, it has got hemoglobin, so it has got it is red in color and therefore, if you had antibodies generated to these sheep red blood cells in rabbit and you put the serum along with the sheep red blood cell as, as I told you earlier the antibody can be represented in a, as a Y shaped structure like this and it had a, it had a two heavy chains and two, two light chains which are um, connected to each other by disulfide bonds in this manner. So, these are your antibodies and let us say that this is the antigen against which the antibody has been raised and in sheep red blood cells one of the powerful antigens are actually uh, carbohydrate in nature in addition to protein antigens. So, these antibodies would bind to this antigen and the complement has the property of binding to an antigen that has bound to an ant, um, uh, antibody or it has the property of binding to the antibody that is bound to an antigen. So, antigen antibody complexes have the property of activating complement the CD is the ca complement cascade. Now, what, do, what does this cascade do? The first component of complement binds to the constant portion of these antibody molecules or the stem portion of this Y and then starts to activate the cascade which finally leads to punching of a hole into the cell that is binding the antibody. So, in this case this is an RBC. So, therefore, you have hemoglobin and the punching of the hole into these RBCs like what I have shown you over here causes a leaching or leaking of the hemoglobin and therefore, this area clears out. So, where is this antibody that is going to be there that will bind to this sheep red blood cell? These antibodies are going to be produced by a B cell that is that is found in this plate. So, therefore, what one does is to take the sheep red blood cell, mix it uh, sheep RBCs, mix it along with different dilutions of the lymphocytes that have been taken taken from the animal's blood. So, you can isolate cells from the blood or for that matter if it was a small small animal like the mouse you could take the spleen which is an excellent source for uh, B cells as well as T cells. So, if you had different dilutions of these B cells you would have these these are uh, I have represented this as each white one as a single B cell over here. So, this B cell would secrete the antibodies the antibodies would then bind to your RBC the, and then they would form a complex of RBC with the antibodies. So, all this is done in a petri plate which has got a semi solid medium like agarose. So, all you have to do is to take molten agarose, mix your uh, sheep red blood cell and the serum or the, uh, or the, uh, 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 the preparation that is containing the cells that is derived from the animal that was bled lymphocytes that have been derived from the immunized animal and then allow this um, agarose to solidify and after which you allow for some time for the antibodies to be secreted and, and uh, binding to the red blood cell after which you overlay it with complement that is derived from the rabbit serum. So, uh, when you freshly bleed rabbit the serum is an active source of uh, complement. So, the complement in turn binds to this complex and the and, and the hemoglobin leaches out leading to the formation of clear areas white areas in a red lawn. So, these are the plaques and therefore, these are called as hemolytic plaque forming cell assay. So, therefore, one could actually evaluate the number of B cells in an immunized animal against uh, against sheep red blood cell. Now, as I told you this is an assay that is based upon the use of sheep red blood cell, but sheep red blood cell can in turn the surface of the sheep red blood cell can in turn be coupled to various kinds of antigens by using certain uh, chemicals or chemical coupling agents which people used to use at that time. So, one could couple uh, KLH, one could couple ovalbumin or other kinds of antigens to the sh surface of the sheep red blood cell and therefore, you had an assay again uh, for an antibody that is being made against the antigen that was coupled to the sheep red blood cell. For example, if ovalbumin is coupled to the sheep red blood cell and you had immunized mice with ovalbumin, you could take those B cells and look at antibodies that were binding 
to these sheep red blood cells that were coupled to ovalbumin. So, you had an antigen specific assay also in addition to just having the sheep red blood cell as a, uh, uh, as a immunogen. So, in addition to this one could also differentiate between two kinds of antibodies in what are called as a direct assay and an indirect assay. Suffice it for now to say that the direct assay gives rise or gives an estimate of IgM producing B cells and the indirect assay gives rise to uh, an estimate that will give uh, that will show you the IgG forming ability of the immunized cells. So, using such assays one could do an experiment that was actually done by Klaman, Chaperone and uh, Triplet in the year 1969. So, they asked the question whether both bone marrow as well as thymus were they needed for active antibody responses by using this plaque forming cell assay that I described to you. So, they took a mouse, they took out the thymocytes and they took out the bone marrow cells. So, you had thymocytes isolated and you had the bone marrow cells isolated. The bone marrow cells would be the source of B cells from the mouse and they took that into and then injected into animals that were irradiated at 950 rad which I showed you earlier was the, was the dosage that was required to, to quote unquote immunectomize or incapacitate the immune cells of the body. So, therefore, one, one could try and see if the thymocytes would repopulate this animal, the bone marrow would, would repopulate this animal and challenge them with an antigen uh, such as sheep red blood cell and do a plaque forming cell assay. So, what did they do? They took a donor mouse and they prepared cell suspensions from the thymus and the bone marrow. Then they introduced these cells into mice, recipient mice that were irradiated at 950 rad. So, either they did this alone or in combinations. For example, here in this mouse, the, this mouse received only thymus derived cells or this is a irradiated mouse, this received thymus cells only. This mouse had a preparation of both thymus as well as bone marrow cells being injected into it and this mouse had only bone marrow cells injected into it. So, therefore, in a short term assay for example, just days later for example, maybe 7 days later just remember that these bone marrow cells the, the ability of the hematopoietic stem cell to form all the rest of the uh, cells in the body would be much more it would take much more time than the experimental time that was used for this um, experiment. So, here when they did when they took these mouse mice and took out the spleens and looked at the ability of these spleen cells to make antibodies. So, they found that when they took the spleen from the animal that had received the thymus only, they found that there was no antibody made although there was the, all these mice were immunized with sheep red blood cell. So, there was no no cells that had the ability to make antibodies as opposed to when they had the thymus as well as the bone marrow being injected, they found that there was an optimal production of plaques as indicated by these white circles over here on a red lawn. And when they injected the bone marrow alone, they found that the ability to make antibodies was very, very minimal com uh, comparable to what was there with the thymus only. As I told you earlier, in this short term duration of these reconstitution experiments, this bone marrow alone would take longer time to differentiate into both B cells and T cells in this animal. And therefore, you would you would evaluate only the ability of the B cells in the bone marrow preparation to make make antibodies. So, what this is the this is a kind of an overall or normalized summary so to speak. One could ask the question whether the B cells in this animal would make antibodies or not. In this experiment what was being looked at is the optimal ability of this animal to produce antibodies and this optimal ability to produce antibodies is, is achieved only when there are T cells as well as B cells. As I told you earlier T cells cooperate with B cells and therefore, the optimum production of antibodies was found in this recipient mice which had received both thymus as well as bone marrow cells.
and therefore the conclusion by Klaman uh, et al that both bone marrow and thymus were needed for an optimal antibody response in an immunized animal. And then came the question what how to show whether actually thymus cells produced antibodies or not. Uh, what if B cells uh, there is a lot of information telling that B cells are producing antibodies, how was it shown that T cells were not producing antibodies. So, this was actually answered in the year 1968 by an experiment that was done by Mitchell and Miller. So, what they did was to take two different kinds of mice over here in indicated as CBA strain which is normally it is brown in color and C57 black 6 which is black in color. So, these inbred strains of mice we will talk about it later on when we come to the class on major histocompatibility complex. Suffice it now to tell you that there are different kinds of mice and some of them are black in color, some of them are brown in color and uh, the, the common laboratory mouse you perhaps may be aware of is white in color. So, what they did was to take out the, th uh, the thymus at a very early stage neonatal thymectomy that means within 3 days after being born. So, this mouse pup was operated upon to remove the thymus and therefore, it had no ability to produce T cells, but it had the ability to produce B cells and the, uh, the adult uh, B6 mouse or the C57 black 6 which is otherwise called as B6 was the donor that gave rise to the adult thymocytes in this animal. Now, some of the principles that were involved in this experiment should be enumerated for you to understand the outcome of this experiment. Now, just like it was found that you could make antibodies to sheep red blood cell, if you take these cells that are derived from different kinds of mice like for example, a black mouse and a white mouse and immunize each other with each other cells. You could make anti serum that are specific to the other strains mouse. This is because of the presence of these markers on the cell called as MHC antigens. So, the MHC antigen is actually a self signature molecule. So, what is a self signature molecule? A self signature molecule is something that indicates self or is something like a fingerprint that is unique to each one of us. So, you could make antibodies to this self signature molecules and therefore, one could raise anti sera against the B6 mouse cells and one could raise anti sera that would react only to the CBA mouse cells. In other words, the anti sera that are raised against these uh, against these cells or so to say anti B6 anti sera would not recognize anti CBA or would not recognize CBA cells. On the other hand anti CBA anti sera would not recognize B6 cells. So, one could use these antibodies in a complement mediated depletion assay which you came to learn in the previous uh, slide. So, what they did was in this experiment. So, after 8 weeks after this thymectomy, they repopulated this mouse which had now grown and become an adult after, after about 8 weeks. They injected these thymocytes that were taken from a different mouse, a black mouse, B6 mouse from the th they took out the thymus and they removed this thymocytes made a suspension of it and injected into the CBA mouse. So, because there were there were no T cells here, these T these thymocytes would actually differentiate here and come to tolerate the CBA mouse cells. In other words, at the way this experiment was done that these T lymphocytes would not react against the CBA mouse cells and the CBA would not react to the T cells because this was already the thymus was already removed. So, once these T cells repopulated these mouse, so you had T cell thymus being the organ where T cells differentiate. Therefore, if these T cells differentiated in this mouse, you had all the T cells derived from B6 mice. And therefore, if you had anti sera that was specific to B6 cells, you could actually recognize the presence of B6 
uh, T cells that are circulating in the CBA mouse. So, this adult CBA mouse was then immunized with sheep red blood cell. So, one could then try to remove the B6 derived T cells or the CBA derived bone marrow cells or the B cells because only the thymus was removed here, the bone marrow was intact giving rise to CBA derived B cells. So, one could raise antibodies to those CBA mouse cells and remove that by using complement in a way that I told you in the earlier slide. So, after 7 days after immunizing with sheep red blood cell, they took out the spleen from this animal made 3 aliquots or 3 pre batches of these suspensions. So, one was treated with anti C57 serum plus the complement and therefore, in this reaction one would assume that all the B6 derived T cells would be would be removed when you added complement because complement would lyse those T cells. On the other hand, if you took out uh, a batch of cells from here and you added anti CBA anti serum plus the complement, it would remove all the bone marrow derived B cells that was there in the CBA mouse. And then of course, you had the control which is very essential for all experiments in all experimental endeavors. So, you had this normal mouse serum which was which would not have any antibodies to B6 or any antibodies to CBA mouse and then added complement to see what would happen just with the uh, as a control where normal serum was added. So, you had now these 3 tubes. So, you had added anti B6 serum. So, therefore, there would be no T cells over here and then you had removed the B cells over here because you, this was the recipient, recipient bone marrow you had removed the B cells and therefore, you lysed all the B cells over here and then the control which would have both the T cells as well as the B cells. Then they added the complement, removed the lysed cells and then looked at the ability of the remaining cells to produce antibodies as I told you in the previous slide. Now, you found that when you added anti B6 serum, still the ability of producing antibodies was retained. Whereas, when you removed the B cells, there was no production of antibodies and when there was just the control anti serum was added which did not have all these specific antibodies, still they, that served as your positive control. Therefore, showing that because you had removed the anti T cells or anti C cells that were raised against the B6 derived T cells despite which the antibody antibody ability to produce antibodies in a plaque forming cell assay was still intact. Whereas, when you removed the B cells the ability to produce antibodies was gone and therefore, the conclusion that thymus was not the cell that produced antibodies and it was the B cells that actually produced antibodies. Of course, the, this conclusion that the B cells production of antibodies was also fortified or supported by earlier observations that if you remove the bursa you would have antibody production that was being inhibited. So, all these experiments in fact, went to show went to show that the B cells actually make antibodies and the T cells were also required. But how the T cells was required to produce optimum antibody responses was kind of still not yet very very clear. And of course, the uh, production of antibody the uh, antigen presenting cells and the role of anti antigen presenting cells or the macrophages was still unclear at that time. So, this experiment showed that in fact, that if you remove these adherent cells. Now, adherent cells are nothing but macrophages you have all these adherent cells being you know, have the ability to stick to a substrate. So, if you took blood cells and then put them in a petri plate you would have all these macrophages sitting tight on the substrate after 37 degree incubation for let us say an hour or so. And if you shook all this and then you had the floating cells and then decant all those floating cells you had in the petri plate stuck macrophages. So, once what was what was the um, uh, need for macrophages did they play a role in immune response at all. So, this was the experiment that actually showed that for optimal production of antibodies you required these macrophages or adherent cells also. The experiment that was done 
it was similar to in fact to the previous experiment. So, you had a donor mouse give, giving you the spleen cells. So, they took the spleen cell population and put them in glass petri plates. So, when you put them in gla glass petri plates, you had the separation after some time at 37 incubation at, at 37, you would call them as the adherent population and the non adherent population. So, after adherence for uh, about an hour, you could shake off and then whatever shook off which was not adherent, not adherent they were called as the NA or non adherent population and the A stands for the adherent population. Now, there was a separate control as I told you earlier controls are very much required. So, a control cell control preparation which was not subjected to this separation by um, incubation on a solid substrate or a petri plate. So, after separation of these adherent and non adherent population they were mixed back in several combinations. Now, as opposed to the earlier experiments this was a kind of an in vitro experiment. They looked at the ability of these cells either combined or isolated for their ability to make antibodies in vitro against the sheep red blood cell. So, they took these uh, preparations and they added sheep red blood cell and looked at their ability to make antibodies to these sheep red blood cell. So, what they found was that if you had the non adherent population alone for example, over here. Now, when you added the sheep red blood cell and incubated it for some time, there was no in vitro production of antibodies. Similarly, when you took the macrophages alone and incubated with sheep red blood cell, they also would not produce antibodies. On the other hand, when you mix the non adherent population and the adherent population and mixed sheep red blood cell along with it you would have the optimal production of antibodies. Now, for this optimal antibodies and the optimal uh, working of this particular experiment excuse me one could also use immunized animals over here and get the non adherent population from a non immunized animal. In other words, if you took the non adherent population which contained the T and B cells which was isolated from an immunized animal let us say for example, an animal that was immunized against sheep red blood cell. So, the B cells were al already activated the T cells were activated and they could cooperate to make uh, the production of antibodies. On the other hand if you remove the, the macrophages these T cells and B cells would not produce optimally these antibodies, but you could combine a non adherent population from a naive mouse which was not immunized and mix them with this adher non adherent population to produce optimal production of antibodies. So, in other words these macrophages did play an important role in the production of antibodies. So, how actually these macrophages uh, uh, play a role in the production of antibodies we will actually explore in the next class. For this we need to understand a few, uh, few aspects um, of how these macrophages or how these uh, macrophages actually take in these antigens and how the T cells function. Because the assay that was used in order to show the function of macrophages involves the property of T cell activation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what does T cell activation mean and what does T cell activation lead to? Now, whenever a T cell is activated one of the primary results of T cell activation is what you call as T cell proliferation. <coughs> In other words once a T cell sees its antigen, the nature of the antigen that it sees we will discuss in the coming classes. Once a T cell sees an antigen, it is recognized by a particular receptor. For now let us call it call it as the T cell receptor. Now, the combination of a specific antigen with the specific T cell receptor gives a signal 
to this particular T cell and the signal results in the activation of proliferation and therefore, there is a cycling of these T cells and more T cells are produced. So, the T cell proliferation is in fact, a hallmark of T cell activation. So, T cell activation whether this activation is produced uh, by virtue of an antigen binding to a receptor or by virtue of a mitogen. A mitogen is something like for example, phytohemoglobin. These have the property of activating T cells by themselves and leading to T cell proliferation. So, therefore, some of the points that I would like to leave you with in, in this class is that the activation of T cells leads to T cell proliferation and how do you follow T cell proliferation? One could follow the division of cells by adding radioactive thymidine. Why? Because thymidine goes in specifically into the DNA and if it is labeled by a radioactive by, by a radioactive uh, precursor. So, you can use radioactive thymidine like for example, tritiated thymidine and that tritiated thymidine would be taken up by the T cells and incorporated into the DNA as the T cell proliferates. So, the extent of T cell proliferation can be followed by the extent of T cell uh, or the extent of thymidine in uh, th uh, tritiated thymidine incorporation into these T cells and uh, CPM or accounts per minute readout uh, from the preparation of these T cells would give you an indication of T cell proliferation. So, we will leave it at this for this class and we will go on into this assay in the next class. So, to summarize we looked at some of the experiments that were done to look, look at how uh, T cells and B cells were in fact very important for immune responses and how was it ha and how it was shown that a hematopoietic stem cell precursor actually gave rise to other kinds of colonies in the spleen. Thank you very much.